اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم میں دا پیس اینڈ بلیسنگز اف اللہ بی اپون یو او حضرت مرزا غلام احمد علیہ الصلوۃ والسلام دا پرومس مسایا اینڈ امام مہدی رائٹس دا فور دا سیکرز دا گیٹس اف ہیونلی سائنز ار از اوپن ٹو ڈے ایز دے ور ان اینی پریویس ایج اینڈ فار دوز ہو ار ہنگری افٹر دا ٹروتھ دا بینکوئٹ اف باؤنٹیز ایز ایز مچ اویلیبل ٹو ڈے ایز ایٹ واز بیفور انڈیڈ بائی دا گریس اف اللہ دی مائٹی Each and every day in the history of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a testimony to this very fact. And inshallah, this is what we will be discussing in today's segment. And for this, we have been joined by our respected guest, Munir Odeh Sahib, who is currently serving as the Director of Production in MTA International. Munir Sahib, Jazakallah, for joining us here in the studio. You have had the blessed opportunity to serve in MTA International right from the, its inception. Uh, and through your work, you've traveled far and wide, you know, from Africa to the Far East. Whenever Hazuri Anwar, Iyadullah Ta'ala bin Isri Al-Aziz, goes on his official tours, he has always spoken of the countless blessings and the wondrous signs of Allah the Almighty's support and help. But again, as part of MTA International, you've had the opportunity to travel on the official tours with Hazur. Could you share with our viewers some of the blessings and signs you've personally experienced or witnessed? It's actually the, the, the experience that you witnessed during the tours. It's just simply because you uh, tend to spend a little bit more time in the proximity of Khalifat al-Masih, Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Nasr al-Aziz. But as a matter of fact, that support and that um, help that the Khalifa of the time uh, enjoys or, or gets In a normal life, I think it's, it's continuous. It's not only on tours or when, when we accompany him, but also it's in private, it's in his daily work. And we get to see it in, in, in the tours just because we, we, it's, it's more visible and uh, it's more public when you see other people meet him and you, you witness those, those events. During um, the trip, with Hazrat Khalifat al-Masih Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Nasr al-Aziz to the uh, islands of uh, Fiji. We arrived at our stay. Um, I was staying with my colleagues and Hazrat al Mumin was staying in the same uh, place, the second floor or the top floor. Um, we slept briefly and um, when it was time for Fajr prayer, um, we had to wait for people to get ready and uh, get out and travel to the mission house for Fajr namaz, Fajr prayers. Um, somebody put the TV on at that time and there was a, an announcement on the TV that there is a, a tsunami that is uh, going to hit Fiji Islands. And it's of a um, very high um, scale. And basically, it's, it would bring devastation to it. And, and you know, it, Fiji is, is extremely exposed in, in that ocean. And you have the, well, you know, you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, um, for, for protection. And you started getting messages from around the world. Obviously, people are worried. Who knew Huzur is, is, is there? And um, uh, asking whether have we have heard the news. Is it true or not? You switched. you know, between channels, you know, CNN, the BBC, and all the local channels. And uh, the story about the tsunami is real, and it's really coming towards Fiji, and there is no escape from it. And the weather was extremely rainy, very heavy rain that you couldn't see in front of you, and the drive was really, really difficult. You could see barely 10, 15 meters ahead of you. So the cars, when, when Hazul came down, um, either the private secretary or Mahdi Sahib informed Hazur about the situation. And um, Hazur very calmly prayed and went to his car and made our way to the mission house. And um, Hazur's prayers are normally long, um, especially Fajr prayers, but that prayer was extremely long. And as Hazur entered, he Uh, stopped before getting to the mihrab and uh, he said to people that there is uh, news that is a, a tsunami heading this way pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the safety and, and protection and he started his prayers and I uh, because there were so many cars outside other 
members of the Qafla couldn't join in time. So I stood outside and I um, prayed in the, in the last line. The Fajr prayer was longer than, than usual. And after Hazul finished the prayers, he got up and uh, walked towards the exit. And it's in the second floor um, prayer hall. And Hazul was wearing his shoes and looked into the horizon. And you could see the horizon. It's such a suddenly stopped raining, absolutely tranquil, seemed very peaceful. And, uh, you know, the colors, you know, from a photography point of view, you see the colors are so lush when it has rained and, and the sun is rising, uh, dawn is breaking. It's, it's just such a beautiful scenery. And then it occurred in my mind, and so like, this is probably this, the, the silence before the, the storm. Uh, there was some fear, I wouldn't deny, but you don't see that on, on the face of the Khalifa of the time uh, and his total uh, submission and tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, an example uh, for the world. And as we made our way, he went back to the room straight away and put the TVs on. And it was still a high alert for Fiji. After literally two, three minutes, then the tsunami was downgraded to a, a lower uh, scale. And slowly, it went till down, down till the, the whole alert has disappeared. Not it was like reduced and you had something, it was almost didn't exist. As if it was swallowed, it was about a few hundred miles away where the, actually the, the tsunami was originating from. And it's as if it was swallowed within the sea and nothing really happened on the shores of uh, the islands. Now, people can say, say it's a coincidence, but what is acceptance of prayers? And what makes foreign TV stations report that incidence and for it to disappear in a such a way um, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and um, by showing his um, support to the Khalifa of the time or the person who he has appointed in this world as his representative. Manusal, the next question is in relation to MTA Al Arabiya. It's recently commemorated 15 years since its establishment. And the establishment of MTA Al Arabiya is a huge milestone in the history of the Jamaat and in conveying the message of true Islam to the Arab world. Could you share some insight as to how this channel came about and the wondrous signs of Allah the Almighty's support? The story of the establishment of MTA3 Al Arabiya is unique in itself. In the very early days of Khilafat al Khamisa, in a mulaqat with Hazrat Khalid al Masih, Uzul mentioned a few dreams that he had prior to Khilafat and how they um, manifested themselves during his life and now during his Khilafat and how he sees them being fulfilled. And part of that discussion was also that the Arabs will join the Jamaat in unprecedented numbers during this Khilafat. Now, there is no new strategy. There's nothing new that the Jamaat is using. There's nothing on the ground that's being done. And Huzul said that we should start an Arabic channel. I really didn't know where to start. But because Khalifa al-Masih has already expressed a wish, the angels themselves start working on these matters and I see that in many areas where I really don't know what to do even with broadcasters even with licenses with different governments and authorities when Hazur says something it it starts to happen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his angels start making this uh, arrangement to to pass what Khalifa al-Masih wished for and I see as I say to a lot of my colleagues and my relatives you know it's People say that the dua, the prayer of the Khalifa is accepted. But I say even more, not only the prayers of the Khalifa are accepted, but the wishes that Khalifa has, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in the angels, make them happen um, if they're in line with Allah's decree and Allah's, Allah's uh, design. And um, 
I see that, I witness that in, in many, many occasions where we are almost, I am almost helpless and um, Allah makes it pass. It's just few uh, small efforts that we have to do and it, it, it does happen. It was here in Bayt al-Fatou where uh, a journalist who was a Palestinian, he was the chief editor for one of the Arabic news channels who was based, which was based in London. Uh, he almost had become an atheist. He was a Muslim, but he's kind of given up on Islam and uh, religion altogether. And while he was touring Bayt al Fatu, he heard the beliefs of the Jama'at, the theology that the alternative, the alternative uh, tafsir that we give. And he was so inspired, and he goes, "You, this should be publicized everywhere." You know, at the end of it, he said, "You should have your own TV station." Then, you know, Huzur's wish, you know, came to my uh, mind again and I said to him, but it's difficult. I gave him the answer that I, I was given. You know, it's difficult, you know, Arab governments don't allow it and it's difficult. He goes, no, this was in the past, the things have changed. And he was uh, so inspired that even before leaving Bayt al Fatu, he was saying like, I think I'm going to do something now. Just give me a second and he made a phone call he called uh, another palestinian who was a vice um, president of um, an arab satellite company and um, he said to him look i have a one of our countrymen here uh, from mta and he wishes to put his channel on satellite can you help him on arab sat or nile sat he goes yes not a problem i said to him look tell him, you know, the Ahmadis. He goes, the Ahmadis. He goes, yes, yes, he knows. So I could hear the other person also speak on the phone. Yes, I know, I know. Uh, I said, tell him, look, Mirzais, Qadianis, just to cover the whole thing so it's not a, a misunderstood thing, you know. Um, it's pretty, you know, to be quite clear. So he goes, no, 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 I know who MTA is. They're on this satellite, they're on that satellite. I'm, I know them fully well. And if he wishes, we can put MTA on in the next three hours, if you want. So I told him, look, you know, hold your horses, wait for our answer. And during that time, I used to go for the Friday sermon uh, broadcast. Huzur was on a tour during that time, and I used to go for every Friday for the broadcast and then come back. So this was during the week. I believe it was a Wednesday. I mentioned to Huzur, this is what, has, this what happened. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a, a bluff, if it's serious, but... Uh, he said to me that he could put MTA on, on air within three hours, if we wish. Uzu said that, get in touch with him and tell him to give you a, a proposal. So I spoke to the guy as we were still standing there, and Uzu was doing his tour. I spoke to the gentleman, and uh, within half an hour he sent uh, a draft contract that we could sign and, and go on air. And um, when we, it was the early days of, of uh, smartphones and so the email came and as Uzur finished and before getting to his car I said Uzur the draft contract has arrived and we have an offer and Uzur stood there and he read the whole contract it's not a long contract it's seven eight pages brief contract and um, from there the instruction came and Uzur said to the chairman of MTA to proceed with this and uh, this is how MTA came to happen. And uh, before this actually materialized, I was going to visit Kababir and Huzul said to, to me, tell them that we are about to start an Arabic TV station. We should prepare ourselves, prepare materials, etc." And when I said that to Amir Saab during the time, and he quite, he speaks about it now, how wrong they were uh, when, when I conveyed the message and here they said to me, you know, we have a challenge producing a 30-page 30 mag 30 magazine every month. You're asking us to start a TV station 24-7. It's impossible. How are we going to do it? We don't have the people. We don't have the manpower. When I came back, I mentioned to Huzur and Huzur said to him, don't worry about it. You know how to read Arabic? I said, Alhamdulillah. He said, for me, that's, that's enough to read Quran, to read the Hadith and the writings of the promised messiah والسلام, that's enough for me so you could see the termination it wasn't extravagant plans but he could see the 
the foresightedness and and the, the clarity of the future that he had, um, it's it's almost unbelievable. And this channel in particular has helped establish Jamaat without a missionary setting foot on 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 on, on the soil of a countries like um, Iraq, Kurdistan. Libya, some remote areas of, of, of Libya, um, even some areas in, Al, um, um, in, in Algeria itself. We have thousands of Ahmadis now, by the grace of Allah. And you could relate by some of the dreams that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already sown the seeds in their hearts, in their minds, and they're waiting for that message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And some people who become Ahmadis have already seen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in their vision. And they see that on screen when they tune into MTA. So you could see the spiritual kingdom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing all that preparatory work for the Jamaat, for the Khalifa of the time and his, his Jamaat that is, is present uh, in this world. But all, all that um, uh, design or all that plan is of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he makes it happen. Manisa, we are fast approaching the end of our segment, but one question that I would like to include here at the end is that in 2013, Hazuri Anwar Ayyad Allah Ta'ala Aziz traveled to Spain, a country which has a, a deep connection with the rich history of Islam. You had the opportunity to call the Azan uh, in the ruins of a, which was a former Muslim village, uh, and this was on the instructions of Hazur. What I wanted to ask was that, how did this come about? Yeah, what was the significance of this? And what were your feelings and emotions at the time? In most of these experiences, there's always a background to, um, to the emotions, to the experience that you have. And, and for sure, traveling with Khalifa al-Masih, you always see, as you see aspects that you don't experience and see otherwise. In my first trip with Khalifa al-Masih, Ayyadahullah Ta'ala bin Nasr al-Aziz, to Spain, you know, we went to... Um, Granada, Alhamra Palace, and it was um, a, a lot of the writing. Sometimes is not readable for for the non-Arabs, maybe, or or sometimes the script is really difficult, even when it's repaired. And so sometimes we used to stop by, try to decipher and, and read what's on the walls. And you keep reading. At, you know, it's a known uh, term. You know. And subliminally, I think it, it has affected me. And I was somewhat low. You know, if you knew that how did you lose all this? It was quite saddened, you know, that how, how the Muslims have, have lost that. I didn't realize that till we were uh, in one of the hotels just after the tour of Alhamra. Um, Huzur uh, passed, was going towards the, the, the prayer hall and he looked at me and said, why, why are you so sad? And I realized that I was quite sad of, of, of the loss of the Muslim and also the, the things they, have to go th they had to go through and, and the suffering. And uh, he said, have you heard um, the dream of Al-Khul Masih Salis, Rahimullah? Have you read? about that. It was here in the same hotel. I said, no, I haven't. And then he asked uh, Qamar Ilahi Zafar Sahib to tell me that after the prayer. Now, I'm not going to go into that. It was emotional. One of them was you know, during Huzur's travel to open the Bisharat Mosque. He could hear the running horses uh, of, of Muslim riders uh, before he even landed in Spain. And the other dream was Wallahu Balihu Amrihi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get to his destination or his, his goal. So, with that in mind, Huzur visited uh, Valencia, and that was the first mosque to be established after the Bisharat Mosque. And it had been uh, quite a long time. Very emotional time with the mosque opening, with, with um, the Khalifa 
of the time Khilafat is being re-established in that country again in that aspect where the Khalifa of the time was, was there. And all these thoughts are in, in your mind. The son of uh, Karam Ilahi Zafar Saab, Dr. Saab, has suggested that uh, Huzur, the last stronghold of Muslims is only 200 kilometers away, where the Muslims were in hiding for uh, a long time after the last Emirates have, ha has fallen. And they're only 200 uh, kilometers away. And eventually, they, when they were found, they faced extreme torture and suffered a lot. Um, and there are some ruins there if Uzur would like to go. Normally, there is an advance party of different people who will go and check what it is, maybe take some pictures and give their opinion to Hazur and, um, of what they've seen and if it's worth attending to or not. So that party came the evening before and they said, Hazur, there is nothing there. It's just few ruins and there's nothing really to be seen there in a small house, a small village and outside there is nothing to be really seen. There's few walls here and there and that's, that's about it. We're almost kind of certain and if that's what it is, it's not worth the travel, you know, it's too much hassle anyway. And uh, Huzur said, we'll decide in the morning. So the next morning, we, when we were getting ready, uh, we heard that Huzur has decided that he is going to go there. Um, against our expe well, expectation, um, we traveled these 200 kilometers. It was not an easy drive, but it was beautiful scenery uh, to get there. We arrived, uh, the MTA team arrived slight, slightly before Hazur did, and it's a small village, a small town, I should say. Um, the locals have felt, you know, there are quite few visitors here, strangers, so they came out to speak to us, and we mentioned that the head of the Ahmadi Muslim community is coming, and uh, the mayor happened to come to his office. He was extremely interested in Keen. He goes, is it possible for me to meet him? We said, yes, it's extremely possible. So we just have to wait. We don't know exactly when Tuzo was arriving. But when he did arrive, it was all this was spontaneous. So uh, the mayor waited. Tuzo arrived. He invited Tuzo to his office. The mayor himself told the story to Tuzo, and the story was quite painful. And he kept apologizing for what the non-Muslims have done to the Muslims. And as he was speaking, uh, Huzur stopped him in the middle of his uh, talk. And um, he said, by the sound of it, it seems like you have Muslim blood in you. And normally for Spanish people, most Spanish people, that's not an easy thing to take, you know, like, and I looked at the mayor, I was like, how is he going to respond? And he actually smiled and he said, maybe because he was mentioning about the children. So the children weren't killed, they were spared. And they thought that they could be kind of made into Christians and they lived their way of life. And the, so, so that blood survived. And, and on, that, on that note, Huzu said, so you may have Muslim blood in you. So because he's a local, he's from the same families who kind of descended from, from those. So he smiled and he goes, maybe. So because he kept repeating that apology and that sentiment of, of shame and, and sadness of what has happened to the Muslims, um, Huzur uh, stopped him and uh, said to him that by the sound of it, that it's not a maybe that you have a, a Muslim blood in you. You definitely have a Muslim blood in you. And then, you know, they both smiled and to, the talk finished and it was quite emotional the whole thing in that small room of the of the mayor and it's all all, all on camera Huzu wrote a small note in the uh, visitors book and then Huzu said we will go to the uh, ruins to see where the houses were and the village that the Muslims inhabited at that time so when we arrived it was a simpler simple few walls are still um, standing the rest are just ruins Huzur walked with his family around and, and accompanied um, Huzur a, a Spanish professor and he was walking around those 
areas. And Hazur was asking about the area, about um, who takes care of it, and um, whether you know they're open for for somebody to come take care of this village and keep it, maintain it uh, for the memory and the history uh, of Muslims in this area. And at the end of the tour, this professor, out of the blue, I mean, why would a Spanish professor say this? And he said, it's like Khilafat has come back to, to Spain, or Islam, Muslims have come back to Spain with their Khalifa. It's okay for an Ahmadi to think that, but this Spanish professor says to Huzur that um, the people should know that the Muslims are back. And that was quite moving. I had goosebumps and I was listening to that as I was filming. And uh, Kamar Sahib suggested Huzur, it, if Huzur thinks it's appropriate, we can call the Azan here. We don't know who's going to come here next. And uh, Huzur felt it appropriate. And he asked who will raise the Azan. And they suggested um, Muhammad Ahmad Sahib to do the, other, uh, the Azan at that time. And it's, it's that feeling, you know, we transformed into another world. And Nuzul said, go onto that minaret and do the azan there. I mean, in reality, there is no minaret. There is a, a broken wall. So Muhammad Ahmad Saab climbs on that wall and he starts to call the azan. And beautiful um, echo from the valley, from the, from the mountains and echoing back. It was really, really emotional. I could really barely just hold the camera and not shake. And it was really a uh, special moment. Everybody was silent, um, remembering the Muslims who were there at that time and what they had to face because of this um, call of prayer or, or because of their belief. And it was, it was a surreal moment. When he finished, he came off that big wall, that minaret, and he came up, came down. And Huzur suddenly moved towards me. I saw him pointing, and I could hear in the, in the microphone, and say, come here, call Munir, because I was quite far. But I could hear that in the, in the headphone, so I got off. I already had goosebumps, quite emotional. And um, he said to me in Urdu, Asal mein yahan se Arab musalmanon ko nikala gaya hai yahan se to unki numaindagi karke us chote pe ja ke azan de and that moment was really out of this world to represent those persecuted people and raise the azan in the presence of the Khalifa of the time, where the manifestation of the Holy Prophet وسلم, to bring back Islam to this world and spread it in this way. It was really difficult for me. My legs couldn't carry me to that small hillock where I stood there and tried to call the Azan. It was really, really hard to get my voice. My voice wasn't really coming out. and It was breaking, it was very emotional. And when I got to Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar at the end, I was thinking, I'm not sure when is the next time this land, these mountains will hear the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the takbir of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala glorifying them. And I said, I will, I was, as, I was, as I was thinking, the, the sky was clear at that time. And out of a sudden, we had a hailstorm hitting. Um, but the funny thing is nobody did anything. You know, it's just everybody stood there in that hailstorm. And it just lasted just saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. And it just finished after that. And you, you could see that in the camera. It's quite quite surreal moment. Very, well, even the heavens are witnessing to that moment. And it's importance, I should say, or... Uh, testimony for, for the truthful of, of that representative who is standing on that ground. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, 